So, Paul, <laughs> uh, these are inter- interesting times. Um, we Indeed have. Indeed, they are. We have uh, finally uh, cost, uh, crossed the threshold of uh, of impeachment. There was a sense that this was, I don't know. I mean, I I guess this was to be expected. Um, well, I think people anticipated it happening earlier. Frankly, um, just give me your your broad overview about like you know the the timing of this. Uh, does it matter that it's maybe some people feel it's a little late, um, but uh, certainly. According to reporting that I've seen, uh, it seems like this was building since the August recess. Yeah, and uh, it, there's an interesting kind of dynamic going on within the Democratic Party. Um, uh, there was a uh, a good article by Ryan Grimm in The Intercept talking about the sort of tensions between the, the more progressive members and um, some of – uh, even even some moderates who felt like they were getting increasing pressure from their constituents, um, uh, that it was really building, that there was a lot of frustration, feeling like Democrats were ineffectual. Um, and that was about not just impeachment, but a whole lot of things that, you know, things like the fact that we have not yet seen um, Donald Trump's tax returns. And the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee seemed to be sort of slow walking that whole process. There was this building sense among Democratic voters that, um, you know, you have this kind of lawless president who is just refusing to um, respond to subpoenas, who was sort of walking all over them, um, and Democrats didn't seem to be doing anything about it. And so that pressure was really building, I think, and I think there was a lot of grassroots organizing that was having an effect of, you know, creating uh, the sense among Democratic members that their constituents were not happy because they're getting all those phone calls and emails and people pressuring them about it. And so that sort of laid the groundwork as that was building. Once you had this story come out um, about this phone call with the president of Ukraine, it just burst. Um, And... Uh, it's interesting is when we go back and look at this and through the lens of history, you're going to see all these little signal events. I think one one of the big ones was the op-ed that was published in uh, the Washington Post the other day by a group of Democratic freshmen who had been among the holdouts. Um, they were they're from more moderate districts. They're uh, people who have uh, experience in either the military or the intelligence community, and they came out and supported an impeachment inquiry. And you immediately saw all of these reporters on Capitol Hill using the phrase uh, "the dam has burst." That that really was kind of the final straw. That that once those people said. The, you know, those members who were resistant before said, OK, now we we too support a, an impeachment inquiry. That was really kind of the final straw. And then, of course, that was even before we saw the whatever version of the transcript that the White House actually released, which appears to be heavily redacted, but is still incredibly in, incriminating. Um, and at that point, you know, there was just no question anymore. Yeah, I mean, the. the uh, it, it's it's interesting to me how the the sort of um, the this was really one of those things where Nancy Pelosi would not get off the dime until it was almost a hundred percent locked in, and even then there seems to be a tremendous amount of reluctance. Which, um, I, well, how do you explain that? Right? I mean, if because I mean I I had a I have a different opinion as to uh, the efficacy of it politically. I certainly um uh thought that the necessity to do this um uh, for the sake frankly of the country it may sound a little corny. It's not usually the way I talk, but um you need to hold if you couldn't hold Donald Trump to account, I don't know why we have impeachment. I don't know why I don't know who you could. But even if you put that aside for a moment from from the the political uh, calculus that Nancy Pelosi was making, right, presumably it was like these frontline, so-called frontline Democrats, they understand their districts uh, better than uh, you do in uh, Brooklyn. And so, uh, you know, we need to uh, honor them and protect them. Well, when they come back from uh, from recess and say, like, we got to do this because it's it, we're, we're getting uh, hammered by this. Why doesn't Nancy Pelosi sort of like go full on in? Why does she need to be? There's still a, a sense of like this is being done sort of kicking and uh, and screaming. 
Yeah, you know, I think that, uh, and I say this as somebody who has great respect for Pelosi and has written lots of things uh, complimentary toward her. I think that there's a there's a degree to which she still thinks about um, a, a conception of uh, congressional politics that is no longer true. Um, uh, if you look over the last few elections, what we're seeing is that congressional elections are getting more and more nationalized. And so there have been analyses that a political scientist have done showing that um, the, the correlation between the presidential vote in a current congressional district and the vote for Congress is getting more and more complete. And so, you know, 20, 30 years ago, you had lots of members who Democrats have got elected in Republican districts and, and vice versa. Uh, and, you know, you could, as one of those members, you know, set a more moderate course, be a little different from your party, and you'd be rewarded for it by your constituents. But that's really no longer true. We're now in a situation for a few different reasons where people are, voters are seeing their own congressional elections in their districts in a national context. And if you think about it, that makes perfect sense. You know, if I am a Democrat um, and uh, I would prefer to have Democrats control Congress, but my congressman is a Republican and I think he's a nice guy, should I vote for him or should I vote for the Democrat? Because that'll make it more likely that the Democrats will then take over Congress. Well, you know, even if he's maybe bringing home some things for the district and you think he's a good guy, it actually makes more sense for you to vote in a kind of a national – with a national view. Um, and more and more voters are, are thinking about it that way. But I think that Pelosi still sees, the, sees a lot more variation in, uh, in what uh, members of Congress can get away with or should be able to get away with. And she has become so focused on those, um, on those frontline members and sees them as the key to, um, to keeping a hold on the majority. And, you know, of course, there's a degree to which to which that's true. You know, there's no question that that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is going to get reelected. Um, and it's much more uncertain for, um, you know, somebody um, who comes from a, a marginal district where they're really going to have to fight and it's going to be close. But there's been a question of, do, do, is that member going to win by being more moderate? Or are they going to win because the Democratic Party as a whole is more energized. Um, and so, you know, this is the, the, the same, the argument that we've been having for a while. But as you said, even these frontline members, they went back to their districts and they were getting an earful from constituents saying, why isn't this guy being impeached yet? And they were feeling the pressure and they came back and said, you know, we have to do this too. So, um, you know, there, there's a there's a kind of a national dynamic to even to every congressional race that I think has taken hold. You know, the old saying was that all politics is local. Um, well, now it really seems that all politics is national. I, I mean, I think that is the case. And, it, you know, when I look back at uh, when uh, the Democrats took uh, the, the House for the last uh, two times they've taken the House, um, one was uh, back in 2006, uh, you'll recall, and, and that race was also nationalized, right? The story of corruption the, that, that sort of uh, coalesced around the idea that, uh, you know, I, mean, I think we like to look back and, and think about it as the war, but I remember in real time that being very, very much about um, uh, Mark Foley and about the, uh, the, the Republican leadership in the House protecting a guy who had been sort of predatory around uh, congressional pages, uh, to the point where I think like the whip, the Republican whip uh, went out. Uh, I think he was from Buffalo at the time, went out for a, a press, a press briefing and surrounded himself with young children so that they couldn't ask questions about that. And <laughs> and that became like a sort of a, a national phenomenon. And of course, I think in 2018, um, uh, all the the data points to people who distanced themselves, who, who went after Donald Trump, even in these um, these uh, purple districts. Uh, or even reddish districts uh, did much better uh, running against Donald Trump. And this seems to me to be a like a turnkey um, a run against Donald Trump, even if you're in, uh, you know, uh, some uh, congressional seat in Iowa, um, you're running against Donald Trump because your opponent will have taken a very explicit position on whether Donald Trump should be held to account. And, and you cited uh, Ryan Grimm's uh, reporting, and I think, frankly, Everybody seems to be citing uh, this reporting. He was um, uh, he has been on this sort of beat about uh, the the 
how democratic politics have been playing out in the house for quite some time. He just wrote a book about it as well. And, you know, it's been fascinating to watch this because uh, as he laid it out in a story that was more or less, I think, reported out before Nancy Pelosi decided to um, to pull the trigger on impeachment. The, part of the dynamic was a a fight between the moderates and the so-called squad and, and, the, and the freshman uh, Congress people who are not just more, uh, you know, progressive in some ways, but but more partisan. Um, which are, which are not necessarily the same things, of course. And, uh, I just remember, uh, you know, Nancy Pelosi rolling out HR one, which I thought was a, a pretty ambitious bill. And I could understand the theory behind it, but they also got bogged down in going after Ilhan Omar at that time. And nobody paid attention to HR one. It was all this story about the democratic leadership going after Ilhan Omar. Um, do you think that in addition to all the implications of, of, uh, that we're seeing with impeachment, that we're seeing a fundamental shift in a a dynamic within the Democratic Party in the House? You know, I, I think it's possible. And I think there's probably a good deal of resentment toward the squad and other young members who, you know, come in and have a different style of politics and get all this attention. Um, and I'm sure that, that members who have been around for a while are thinking, you know, how come I'm not, uh, you know, on TV every night and on the cover of magazines? And, um, and the, the number so. three fu- fundraiser in the Democratic caucus. I mean, she's raised yeah. more money than just about anybody in the, in the caucus. Yeah, so I think that that has something to do with it, and I think there's there's still you know persists a somewhat uh, naive belief that you know you often hear people say, well, you know, we just need to stick to kitchen table issues and uh, show the public that we have good ideas that'll improve their lives. And as you say, you know, that's all good. Um, it's good to you know think about those issues and lay down um, things like HR one so that you know what you want to do once you actually have the chance. But there's a there's a naive belief that that will actually get you some kind of credit that people will ever know. Um, But, you know, the the reality is that that that's going to pass by without notice by most people. But once you have some kind of, you know, dramatic inter-party conflict like you did with with the stuff about Ilhan Omar, that's going to suck up all the attention because we have a media system that is, you know, that that goes toward conflict like moth to a flame. Um, So, uh, so, you know, I I don't I, I. never really understand why professional politicians think that they're going to get uh, any kind of degree of attention for their, you know, substantive, meaningful, important bills. Um, As I say, like, that's something that that the Democratic Party should do during this period, uh, but it's mostly because they need to prepare themselves for when they actually have power. So if you, you know, they've already written HR1 and it has lots of nice reforms in it. And so, um, you know, if they get a Democratic president elected and they have control of Congress, then that is ready to go on day one. And that's great. Um, but it's not going to get you a whole lot of credit uh, in the meantime. So, you know, those are, I, I think that that in many ways, um, people like uh, like Ocasio Cortez are much more in tune to um, the way politics works now, um, and you know, a lot in many ways for better, in some ways for worse. But they but they understand it, um, and so that's part of the reason why they get the attention that they do. Um, we have about four minutes left. Give me a sense of how you think this should happen. Uh, we don't know exactly all the details about in terms of like timeline. There's some talk uh, by Democrats this week that we should only focus on uh, Ukraine as opposed to the wide litany of things that are impeachable offenses uh, by this president. Um, we, we've heard that basically the the multiple committees will continue to work and refer things to the judiciary, which I think cuts against that idea that it would be just one uh, issue. But what do you think optimally from your perspective would be the best way to handle this? When would it end? When would the vote take place? What would happen in between? Well, there's two things to consider. Um, one is whether the process can actually um, elicit facts that we don't already know. And it might. Um, You know, we've seen we're learning more facts seemingly on an hourly basis. Um, So there's that consideration of what is it going to take to actually to get, uh, you know, everything that we need to understand. Although, you know, a lot of it we already know. I mean, the president went on television and admitted to his impeachable conduct, as did his lawyer. Um, So so that's one part. And the other part is. 
you know, the reality is that this is, a, this is a spectacle that you want to create. You want to be able to educate the public. You want them to understand, and you want to have something that will, uh, that will be on television that they can watch, and so they can have the facts laid out for them. Um, and there are a number of different ways you can do that. You know, they had talked about having a select committee, uh, but it seems like they've, they've rejected that idea. Um, you know, one hopes that it doesn't devolve into the kind of, you know, uh, series of five-minute little grandstandings that we see so often in committee hearings. You'd, I think it would be much better if you had some kind of professional counsel who was the one doing most of the questioning because that always ends up producing, you know, things that are more fruitful. But a big question is how much is the administration going to stonewall? Are they going to refuse to? Uh, to answer subpoenas when when the committee issues them, are they going to refuse to answer questions once they get there? Is it going to be like like Corey Lewandowski every time we actually have um, a witness testify? Uh, I don't think we know the answer to that question yet. Um, but the, the, if they are, as they are now seem to be saying, going to, going to restrict this to just the Ukraine matter, well, it seems like you could handle that pretty quickly. Um, it didn't, wouldn't have to take months and months. I mean, it's pretty but, straightforward. But we why would you want to? Did. But why would you want to? You know, I think the rationale that they that they have is that this is something that it's easy for the public to understand. The misdeed is clear, and therefore, you know, we can just sort of get through that and make our case without having to bring in a whole bunch of stuff that maybe you know you have to teach people about, or the people, or maybe it seems less clear to people. Things about emoluments and self-dealing, and we get into these arguments about, well, you know, was the Air Force actually going to go to his no, resort but anyway? I still, <laughs> all these things. But why would but you that, want that, this that's, to that's pass? Their, that's their argument. They're, I mean, but they must have a fundamental belief in that instance that the real jeopardy is um, uh, is basically um, that the Democrats will burn themselves on this. I mean, that's the only explanation because otherwise, I mean, if you thought the net benefit was for Democrats, you would, I don't know, drag this out till July. <laughs> like, you know, uh, you're, congratulations, you're impeached and you're the Republican nominee. Um, I think you're exactly right. And I think that it does come down to that kind of lack of faith. The Republican approach to this is just shoot in every possible direction you can, and you never know what you might hit. And it's true because on the eighth congressional investigation of Benghazi was when they discovered that Hillary yeah. Clinton had a private email server, the yeah. eighth. And, um, but there's a feeling among a lot of Democrats that, you know, we shouldn't really that, that, that if we really tell people what we really think, they're not going to like us. And so we have to kind of, you know, be as gentle as possible and careful. And um, and if we're too, you know, if we are too mean to Trump, then we'll be punished for it. If we're too progressive in what we advocate, we'll be punished for it. So there's this that is a kind of a deep seated affliction that the Democratic Party has had for decades that they they believe that the public is always ready to punish them and ready to reject them. Oh. Um, and I think that that's that that you're going to see part of that uh, in in how they end up planning these these impeachment hearings. All right. Well, uh, Paul Waldman, I, I hope uh, I hope uh, they uh, they listen to us and not to themselves. I appreciate uh, your time today. <laughs> Thanks. My pleasure.